Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to River Church's online worship. I'm Pastor Randy, and this is River Church. We are so glad that you could join us today. Uh, We're making these videos each and every week because we realize that some of you are still self-isolating. You're staying at home, and we respect that. I encourage you to go with your conscience. And so I'm I'm just honored that you would invite me into your home this morning and take the time to worship with us together. Uh, Now, I want you to get ready because we're about to worship. I want you to get ready by going and getting your Bible and something to write with, notepad, pen. Um, At the end of today's sermon, I'm going to ask you some some poignant questions that I want you to think on the rest of the day. And so you want to write those down. We're going to be studying a lot of scripture passages. You're going to want to be able to turn there and follow along. Isaiah chapter 9 is the first place. You can mark that before we ever begin. Uh, you want to get rid of some distra- any distractions? Maybe put your pet out for the, uh, for the, for the morning, uh, for the next 45 minutes. Uh, go fill up your coffee cup and, and get ready to worship. Uh, if you have any questions about River Church, all things River Church can be found on our website, riverchurchrgv.com. Uh, in just a few hours, uh, right here, Um, In this space, uh, River Church people will show up and we will worship together. Uh, But but for now, you and I are going to worship together in in, in your living room or wherever you are right now. Um, One important event that's coming up in just a few days is our Christmas Eve service. Uh, Of course, that's on Thursday, the December 24th. It'll be at 6 p.m. right here in the building. If you are ready to get out at that point, or if you know somebody else who's looking for a place to worship on Christmas Eve, River Church would be a great place to do that. 6 p.m. It's become our uh, most popular service of the year, really. It's a great time to see friends and loved ones and some extended family members who have flown in for the uh, for, for, for the for the week, and uh, it's, we, we read the, 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 the Christmas story and sing our favorite songs, and, and then we go home. We'll be done by 7 p.m. So if you're able, I hope you'll join us this Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. right here at River Church in Brownsville, Texas. All right, well, let's get ready to worship. Good morning and Merry Christmas. I'm Pastor Randy, and this is River Church Online Worship, and... Uh, This is our fourth and final Sunday of Advent as we look forward to Christmas, which is just a few days away. And over the last month, we've been talking about Christmas cheer. And boy, do we need some Christmas cheer. Moving into 2021, we need some optimism, some hopefulness, some confidence. And that confidence can be found in the story of Jesus The baby Jesus in the manger, who grew up to be the savior of the world, who now rules and reigns on high in heaven. Boy, do we need some Christmas cheer, some hopefulness moving into 2021. So I've been working on that in my own life. I've been watching the Christmas movies with my family, working on that Christmas cheer. And I've been listening to the Christmas music coming and going at home and at work. I've been thinking on those perfect gifts for the family. But I've also been heavy hearted that I might miss Jesus right in the middle of the Christmas season. And so today, for the fourth Sunday in a row, we go to this most famous passage in Isaiah, probably the most famous Christmas passage in all of the Bible. And it's there that we go to find our hopefulness, our confidence, our Christmas cheer. Let's read it together one final time today. Isaiah 9 says, For for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Hundreds of years before Jesus was was born, this baby to be born in the manger, in the barn. Hundreds of years before that, the prophet Isaiah spoke into a weary world looking for something to rejoice in. 
And he spoke these words. The Messiah is coming. And our hope will be found in him. Now, thousands of years later, in 2020, we live in a weary world looking for something to rejoice in. And, and again, again this year, we point to the story of Jesus and say, this is where our hope lies. This passage just jumps off of the page. like It just begs to be sung. It's such a rejoicing, hope-filled passage. So, so the passage, uh, we've camped out here for four weeks. Uh, it, it describes Jesus in four ways. We've looked at three of them already. It says that Jesus is a wonderful counselor, like the best counselor you've ever been to in your life, and then exponentially greater than that. He understands what you're going through. He's been there himself. He's walked in your shoes. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Number two, it says that, he, that Jesus is mighty God. He's not less than God. He's not junior God. He is God. The third description is that he is everlasting Father. And last week we talked about the Trinity. God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you can, you can go online and watch that sermon if you missed it last week. And now today... This last descriptor is that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. That's where we're spending our time this morning. <clears throat> Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The Bible says that Jesus ushers in a new era of peace. In fact, he, it says that in this passage that he ushers in peace and justice. Where do I get justice? Well, in this passage that we read today, it speaks of a new government that Jesus forms figuratively speaking. Jesus ushers in peace and justice. The opposite, what we, what we see in this world too often now is, is a world of pride and oppression. Pride and oppression, but, but Jesus ushers in a new era of peace and justice. We live in a culture of pride and oppression. And into that, Jesus brings peace. And he does it through you and me, friends. He does it through the church. If we don't do it, it doesn't get done. Peace. That's a big deal. Without, without peace, in fact, the continuation of human life would not be possible. Without peace, the continuation of human life would not be possible. The continuation of of human life, eternal life, eternal life for you and me requires peace, peace with God. Uh, for, for as long as we are at enmity, as long as we are opposed to God, we're not at peace with God, we have no hope of eternal life. That is why the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, came into the world that he himself created. He came into the world to make peace. Romans 6 speaks of eternal life. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus came to make peace between us and God that we might have eternal life. Jesus is, in fact, the only peacemaker, ultimately. Jesus Christ is the only way for us to experience peace with God, and Jesus is the only way for us to experience peace with one another. And a right relationship with God is, is the key to a settled existence with the rest of creation. A right relationship with God is the only way for us to be at peace with one another. It's no wonder there's such a lack of peace in this world. So Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Isn't that beautiful? He's the Prince of it. The Prince of Peace. Because he alone can achieve three things. And we're going to talk about those things today. Number one, 
Jesus restores broken relationships. And many of you are suffering through broken relationships right now. You, you may have a, a broken relationship with God and feel as though he's a million miles away, distant. You may be living in the, um, the pain, the sorrow of a, of a broken relationship on a human level. A friend, a loved one, a family member. The restoration of your fractured relationship with God is the beginning point of what Jesus does in your life. But it's not all that he wants to do in your life. Not only does he want to bring peace where there was once enmity and, and, and strife between you and God. He now seeks to bring restoration to every other relationship you find yourself in. And he is... Not going to stop there either. Not only is he going to make your relationship with God right, not only is he going to right all the relationships on a human level, Jesus is turning you into a peacemaker yourself. Boy, this Christmas season, we need more peacemakers walking this earth. He's making you into a peacemaker, an, an agent of reconciliation. Reconciliation, that means a reunion-making, fence-mending, enemies-becoming-friends sort of a person. The ministry of reconciliation. That's your role. That's your responsibility to be a minister of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that means that you are, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He is your Lord and Savior. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You're a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of of reconciliation. There it is. You no longer can just wait for peace on earth. You have to do the work of bringing peace on earth. No longer can you just wait around for others to make peace with you. It is now your responsibility to be a peacemaker, a minister of reconciliation. If Jesus' peacemaking works on two levels, that is, on the level of our relationship with God, a vertical level, and then peacemaking on a horizontal level between us as human beings. If Jesus' peacemaking works on two levels, uh, then in some ways, our being made a friend of God is more understandable, and Jesus' work to make us friends with those around us, those who have been our enemies, like that seems a little more abstract, a little abstract, a little more unachievable. It seems like sometimes that is even hard to wrap our arms around, that, that Jesus might make our enemies on this, world, on this earth our friends. Our Lord is the Prince of Peace, and he has made us peacemakers so the work is now ours to do. Jesus came to make peace, to, to mend broken relationships. Matthew 5 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. If you're a peacemaker, Jesus says you're blessed. Are you a peacemaker in your coming and going in life? Are you a minister of reconciliation? You know the biggest hurdle to being a peacemaker, the biggest hurdle is that you don't naturally have peace within your own heart. 
There's nothing to draw from. There's no well to draw the water from. If you're naturally a person of strife, that means anger and and bitterness and rage. Anger comes out of you if it's inside of you. It's hard to be a peacemaker when we have no well to draw from. And you might say, well, 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 Pastor Randy, that person made me angry. Or my, my kids, they, they make me angry. Ah, that may be how we see ourselves as simply reactors, kind of victims of our circumstances. Ah, but, but the Lord, he sees it differently because the Lord, he searches the heart He searches our hearts. And what does he find? Jeremiah 17. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. To give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. We, we, we wonder, well, why can't I be a peacemaker? Why can't I draw from this well of peace within me? And I would say, maybe there is no well at this point. You see, this passage says that the heart is deceitful. You say, I, I'm not an angry person. You just made me angry. Ah, the heart is deceitful, it says, above all things. That is why God must search the heart and, and, and test us, it says, and, and make the determination himself. Why? Because I deceive myself. I can't make the determination. The Lord can. God searches the heart. He determines what's in there that that person that that made you angry he didn't put the anger in your heart he just pushed the right buttons and and drew it out there's nothing that comes out of your mouth that wasn't already in your heart really It, it might take a little prodding but it will come out if it's in there Maybe when you haven't had enough sleep. Maybe when you've had a bad day. Maybe when you've had too much to drink. When you decide not to hold back any longer. Not to hold your breath any longer. So peace with your spouse and peace with your children and and your co-worker and and the clerk at the grocery store and and your, your political foe your extended family. The the Lord wants to make you into an agent of peace, a minister of reconciliation. But first, but first he must give you a new heart. Ah, yes, the Lord Lord searches the heart and, and frankly, that can be an embarrassing problem because until we get a new heart, James 2 says, so whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. So the end result is how I relate to others. But the starting point is that I need a new heart. The end result is how I impact and relate to other people. But the starting point is the condition of my own heart. I need a new heart. And Jesus gives us new hearts. This is the second way in which Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Jesus alone brings peace to the human heart. There's no other source of peace other than Jesus alone. 
There will not be eternal peace, external peace rather, until you find internal peace. Let me say that again. There will not be external peace in your life until you find internal peace. You say, what's wrong with me, Pastor Randy? The fact is, you and I both, we need a new heart. The old heart, deceitful. Above all things, desperately sick. Who wants that old thing anyway? I want a new heart, and I bet you do too. I pray for a new heart. You should too. The the Lord searches your heart. The Lord also searches my heart. You look look here behind behind the pulpit. If you were here today, you'd be looking up on the stage. And you see a pastor doing his best to communicate the word of God. But the Lord looks at me through a very different lens. Because the Lord searches my heart too. And Colossians 3 says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed Uh, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You see, there comes a point in Pastor Randy's life, comes a point in my schedule when I, I realize I need a new heart. I need to go to my office and close the door and let the word of Christ dwell richly in my soul. I need to slow down. I need to realize that that God is not impressed with the title of pastor. You may be, I don't know, but the Lord is not impressed with that title. I, I... I lay low before the Lord and I I usually sing a song to God and then I'm just quiet. I shut my mouth and I listen for the Lord's voice. And he searches, he searches my heart. And he, he knows me deep down. And he gives me a new heart. How do I know when the peace of Christ is ruling my heart? Let me ask that question again. How do I know the peace of Christ is ruling in my heart? Because there's joy and there's lightness to my step that's not totally connected to my circumstances. You see, it's easy to be lighthearted and have a, a joy about you when things are going great, when your circumstances dictate that, when you got more money, somebody just gave you a new car or an awesome gift, and everybody, everybody wants to be hanging around with you, and you're just, things are looking up. Then a temporary joy and lightheartedness comes pretty easy, but But here's how I know that the peace of Christ is ruling in my heart. There's a joy, there's a lightness to my step that's that's not totally connected to my circumstances. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there where where there are times where maybe you, you thought you ought to be happy, but you just weren't? Scripture refers to this as a peace which defies understanding. Uh, When we have a joy and a a lightness to our step that is not totally connected to our circumstances, Scripture refers refers to it as a peace which defies understanding. When I experience a joy and a lightness to my step that is not totally connected to my circumstances, I'm reminded that Scripture refers to that as 
a peace which defies understanding. Philippians 4 says, In the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts, guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah, there are times where we have a peace in our heart that doesn't even make sense when the storms are raging around us. Jesus spoke calm to the storm on the lake, and he will speak calm into the storm of your life, if you ask him. You ever feel like your joy and your circumstance don't match up? I mean, it can go either way. I mean, when, when there is no joy in our hearts, sometimes I think this, like, I should be happier than I am today. I mean, things are going well for me, and yet I'm just sad. On the other hand, when the peace of Christ rules in my heart, when I'm talking to myself, it goes something like this. Things are tough around me, but I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm making it. There's joy in my heart. You know, I hope this feeling is more familiar to you. <laughs> There's stress and disappointment in my current life, but joy has remained strong. Through it all, there's joy. You know, when the peace of Christ rules in my heart, there's a joy and a lightness to my step that it's not, not, not even a little bit connected to my circumstances. Times is totally disconnected. Now, the question you might ask is, how do I get a new heart from the Lord, Pastor Randy? How do I do that? Well, you ask him. You ask him. I, I told you my story. I get away. I get alone. I'm quiet before the Lord. You simply ask him. You realize I'm lying to myself. There's no peace in my heart. I want a new heart. I want the peace of Christ to rule in my heart. And then in humility, you go before the Lord and you ask him. And know this. The pursuit of of a new heart is so worth it. But because the return on that investment is eternal. Who doesn't want an investment that rewards for eternity? So, so the question turns from what's in your wallet to who's on the throne of your heart? There's a third, a last way in which Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Number three, Jesus ultimately achieves lasting, eternal peace. In my heart, on this earth, but not just for the day, not just for the lifetime. Ultimately, what Jesus achieves is lasting peace eternal peace. There's a bigger picture here in Jesus being the Prince of Peace. But life's hard, I know that. Life's hard for you, life's hard for me. First Peter 1 says this, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead now we live with great expectation. What are we expecting? And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Pure. Undefiled. Beyond the reach of change. And decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive his salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last day for all to see. So be glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, 
even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Jesus ultimately and eternally achieves lasting peace. There is eternal reward that comes from Jesus. If if all you you were to, to receive from Jesus was peace in your heart for today or for the next month, well, I suppose that'd be kind of cool. But but no, there's more. There is eternal reward. When he was about to leave this world after his life of ministry and then his death, burial, and resurrection from the grave, when he was about to, to part from the world, leave his disciples, he encouraged them to believe this. Um, a few chapters earlier in John chapter 14 when he tells them that he's going to go to the cross he's he's going to go through with this this plan of salvation and they don't quite understand he says this look this is good news he says peace I leave with you Jesus says my peace I give to you not as the world gives you gives do I give you Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The story of the Bible, an ethic, a teaching that we are compelled to believe, is that the peace that Jesus offers to us, it's not like the peace that the rest of the world offers. I mean, that's cool. There are great organizations and and, and great people working for peace on this earth, and that's awesome. But frankly, it's for a lifetime at best. And Jesus says it's not that kind of, it's not a temporary peace that I will bring. It's not some peace accord between two nations that's written down on a piece of paper but could easily be torn up or could only last for a few administrations. No, Jesus says the peace that I bring is for eternity. My peace, I leave. My peace, I give. Matthew 11, 28, it says this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This passage speaks of the eternal battle for rest in our hearts i want rest today yes but but i want rest for eternity and jesus offers us that so we could wrap this up the conclusion i have three questions it's kind of self-evaluation self-awareness what do we do with this passage i'm really looking to ask what fills your heart today. Is it anger? Is it strife, turmoil? Is it peace? Is life for you just one big anger management exercise, just trying to trying to keep it all in? Question number one is this. How peaceful are you internally this morning? Are you okay with yourself? Are you okay with God? Are you okay with others? With your circumstances in life? How peaceful are you internally this morning? You might want to write these down because they'll be good questions for you to meditate on today as you go before the Lord and ask him for a new heart. Question number two is, is this, and they're all quite similar. How are you doing at being an agent of reconciliation in this world? You know, going going to the store, dealing with your in-laws, relating to your kids, in your marriage relationship. How are you doing being a, a peacemaker? an agent of reconciliation. We we, we lie to ourselves because the heart is deceitful. 
But, but let's try and be honest now. This well that you're drawing from is the, the end result peace, friendship, or is the external result strife and enmity and anger and turmoil? Are you a peacemaker? Kind of depends on the well that you're drawing from, doesn't it? And the third question, self-evaluation. You don't have to share your answers with anybody, but you might want to write the question down. How hopeful are you regarding the future? And specifically, your eternal future. How hopeful are you? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I like to call him the doctor. Because he's told us, he says, um, I've come not for those who are well, but for those who are sick. He says he came for those in need of a doctor. He wants to give you a new heart today. If you'll admit that you need a new heart, he'll give you a new heart. I'll end with this, this passage uh, it's probably the most appropriate passage for us to read today regarding this topic. And Jesus is a prince of peace. He came that, 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 that we might see reconciliation in our relationships. He came that he might give us a new heart. He came that he might ultimately achieve for us peace eternal. So this last passage, Ezekiel 36, the words of the Lord. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That's what we want, right? That the Lord might remove my stinky old heart that's like a rock, like a stone. It's just cold and dead. And give me a, a heart that's alive. A heart that's just infused with the peace of Christ, that I might be a peacemaker, that I might be an agent of reconciliation, seeing enemies made friends. Let's ask him for that this morning. I'm going to pray briefly for you, and I encourage you to spend some time today. Go before the Lord. Ask him for a new heart. Oh God, we come before you today in this Christmas season saying that, that once again this year, a weary world rejoices in you. We live in a weary world looking for the source of peace. And frankly, many of us watching this video today, worshiping here today, we ourselves are weary people. Now we'd like to turn in our heart of stone. And we'd like for you to, in place of that, give us a heart of flesh, alive and, and vibrant and filled, infused with the peace of Christ. God, I pray for my friends watching this today that this would be the best Christmas that they've ever experienced. It's been a hard year. Would you bless them with, with the peace of Christ in their hearts that they might overflow and, and might make peace wherever they go. May they rest well. And may they live well as peacemakers. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. It's, it's been good, good to be with you today. All right. Well, that's it for the day. That's a wrap. Um, I want to encourage you to do a few things now. Uh, number one, I encourage you to spend the rest of your day uh, meditating on, yeah, the questions that you wrote down, but more importantly, meditating on the Lord. 
Ask him that he might do a work in your heart, that he might speak to you, that he might bring peace and joy, and that you might therefore be a peaceful person. Spend some time, maybe go on a walk, spend some time with the Lord today. I would also encourage you, if you have any questions or any needs, to send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. I or one of, one of the other elders, if we, can, if we could together pray for you or, or meet a need in any way, if you'll send me an email, we, the elders, the pastors here at River Church, we will do anything we can to serve you. Maybe you're alone. Maybe you're isolated. Maybe you uh, don't really have a church home. We'd love to help you get connected to River Church. But you can go on, online uh, to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and you can see how you might get connected. There are a number of um, gospel communities, like small groups, gospel communities that are, uh, that are starting up again January 1st. Uh, about eight different opportunities, ways that you can get connected, the way that you can, ways that you can live in community. Uh, some opportunities for you to live in community, um, even if you're still staying at home, because there are some online uh, gospel communities. Boy, I hope every one of you will consider joining, being a part of that. It's easy. You go to our website. It's a get connected button. You've got several options. You choose a group. There's even a choice that says, I don't know which group I want to be in. Could you help me choose a group? It's simple, almost effortless. Just go to the website and get connected so that 2021, for us as a church, might be our, 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 our best year as far as being connected and friends as a church. So go to the website and, and sign up for a gospel community. I also want to encourage you right now to go to our website and give. Um, there's a, a giving page, and you can give uh, in a safe, secure, electronic way. It's pretty quick and intuitive and, um, and even kind of fun. Um, listen, the needs are real at River Church right now. Um, the need is today. Uh, I'd like to see us finish strong as a church uh, this year, finish strong financially able to meet all of our obligations and that's going to take a partnership that's going to take some of you who have not been generous this year maybe you've been just dealing with real fear financially it's going to take you uh, stepping out and being a generous person at the time of year i've encouraged you i'm going to encourage you the same way right now i've already i've already said this to you uh, a time or two but i want to encourage you this christmas season to give your best gift to the Lord. In other words, your most expensive gift. How do we do that? Well, we give to the ministry of the church. That's always been how we give to the Lord. We give to the local ministry of the church. So I want to encourage you to give to River Church. Uh, we could sure use your financial gift right now in this season that we might finish strong, uh, that we might be prepared or poised or positioned to 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 begin 2021 strong. Um, I love you guys. I know you're going to step up. I know some of you are going to give, maybe even for the first time. And, and I want to say thank you to those of you who have been giving all year. You've been giving extravagantly. You've been giving generously. And, and that's why we've been able to continue the ministry at River Church. So I say thank you. And I look forward to seeing some of you people give for the first time in the next few days hopefully today all right well I want you to know I'm praying for you I'm, I'm encouraged by the life stories that you guys are living out and I look forward to seeing you again soon have a good day